<laughs> we're going to start about uh, 30 seconds here. Uh, let me get my uh, information up. And we have uh, right now we have 23 people, but uh, uh, like a typical classroom situation, uh, they'll come in late. So, and I've got to. Yeah, I mean, I could actually make an assignment for people to work on. <laughs> Give them a quiz the first five minutes. I don't get them on time. I got to move. I got to. I got to put my fence up because my dog is bothering me. So, Okay, out, out, out. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, Michael, or Michael, I think we're going to start. So why don't you hit record? Yep, we're recording, Dr. Kittleson. I don't see it where it says recording. It, it is recording. Okay. Yeah, it's recording to the cloud if you look at the participants list. Okay, there it is. Okay, good. Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to NYMC's Department of Public Health's National Public Health Week Speaker Series. I'm Dr. Mark Kittleson, Chair of the Department of Public Health, and we are having an exciting conclusion to this week's with Dr. Alagrante's uh, talk. Uh, I'll be introducing Dr. Alagrante just shortly, but uh, We've had an outstanding set of presentations this week. On Monday, we heard from Dr. Howard Kippen, or Kippen from Rutgers uh, that discussed air pollution. Tuesday, we heard from Dr. Oscar Allen on the role of the city and county health commissioner's uh, departments. Uh, yesterday's talk by Dr. Nancy Stambler discussed the role of biostatistics in pharmaceutical companies trying to get new drug approvals. I, I've, I've really enjoyed all of them. First, a few things to deal with. This is being recorded and it will be posted on the department's web page within a short time. I'll be typing that web page along with the direct link to these uh, videos uh, uh, into the chat after I get done with my introduction. Uh, you can just go there and you can make note of those. Uh, Dr. Alagrantes hopefully will be posted tomorrow or so. Uh, this event is sponsored in part by the student organization STUI the Student Healthcare Executive Group. It's led by President uh, Brian Batista. I thank Brian and all of his officers for helping make this event happen. Stewie is very much involved in service to the campus and the community. And during this week, they are heavily involved with Feeding Westchester. For more information, I encourage you to visit the Stewie webpage. Again, I'll post that as, long, uh, as well as their specific link to helping uh, your uh, provide uh, volunteer service or, or, or funds to feeding Westchester. So I'll send both of those in the chat room. We are asking that you stay muted. And if you have any questions, please type it in the chat box. At the end of the presentation, we'll have about 15 minutes of Q&A. Uh, and we'll have someone monitoring the chat to ask questions. We're also being assisted by the Department of Educational Media with Michael Frank for serving as our IT specialist. Should there be any problems with this event, such as a Zoom bombing, we will end the presentation and you will immediately receive a new email with a new, or an email with a new link. Thank you, Michael, for your help. And finally, to help with our comply with our agency's, our accrediting agency's request to maintain contact with our alum, if you are an alum of our MPH, our MS, or DRPH, we ask that you consider completing our alumni survey located in the chat. And again, I'll put those in there. There's one for masters, uh, MS, and MPH, and another one for the DRPH. Uh, it is really my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. John Alagrante is a distinguished professor at the Teachers College in, uh, at, at Columbia, along with the appointment over at the Mailman School of Public Health. It would take probably the entire hour to give you an overview of Dr. Alagrante. I'm not going to do it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send a link in the chat, and I really encourage you to read it. It is an impressive bio sketch. Uh, uh, instead, I want to share a more personal story. But let it be known that Dr. Alagrante is a professor's professor. He's an exceptional teacher. He's a renowned scholar, unselfish in his service to the, to the profession. If health education had a GOAT classification, if you know what a GOAT classification is, it's in, or in sports, the greatest of all time, he would certainly be on that list. So I'm, I'm definitely going to send you that uh, link. Please look at it. But I want to share a more human story. Uh, I think it, it tells a lot about him. Around 1998, I was a professor and graduate director of health education at Southern Illinois University. 
two years earlier, I was able to secure an endowment from, from a retiring legend, Dr. Robert Russell, to fund the visiting scholars to come to campus. Now, the general plan was that the scholar would arrive a day or two early, meet with faculty and students, give a talk, uh, perhaps on Monday evening. And then on Tuesday, he would uh, uh, give a, a short talk and meet with doctoral students who are giving their uh, showcase of their research projects. That was the plan. My first two visiting scholars, although exceptionally strong scholars, did not follow that plan. Both had come to campus just prior to the Tuesday event and both left almost immediately afterwards. It was really disappointing. And not only for myself, but my faculty were thinking, boy, is this really what we wanna do for this visiting scholar? We were determined though, let's keep trying, we'll figure this out. So John was our third uh, scholar visit and talk about being totally different from the previous two. First, I believe he arrived on a Sunday evening and Monday, he graciously gave, spent hours with our faculty and students. Monday night, he gave a campus lecture. And then on Tuesday night, he gave a short but very inspiring talk to our doctoral students prior to their showcase. He then spent the entire evening with each of those students talking about the projects. And at that time, Southern Illinois was, if not the largest doctoral program, it was one of the largest. We had a lot of students in that particular program. Next day, John spent hours with students on a one-to-one -one format. He had lunch with the student a group called Eta Sigma Gamma, and he left NYMC or New York City on Thursday morning. His visit was really inspirational in a number of ways. One, it put to rest any consideration of this particular scholar visit. We definitely are going to go ahead with this. Uh, students incredibly enjoyed his experience, his wisdom, and his advice. You know, I'm still in contact with a lot of these students and they all relate that this was one of the highlights of the doctoral program. And from a personal standpoint, John served as a real model on how a professor should handle themselves. I was a relatively new full professor and uh, I was really uh, able to see how a professor handled themselves. Uh, you know, I had I have major regrets that we didn't ask him first, <laughs> but uh, from the time that Dr. Allegrante visited us until I left in 2011, John's visit was the expected uh, expectation of all of those who were selected as a Robert Russell visiting scholar. And it's been a quarter of a century since that visit and I'm still, still am impressed with how he handled himself. So uh, thank, John, thank you. <laughs> it just, it was a great experience. You are uh, a, a true legend in the profession. I thank you for taking the time. So with no further ado, I am pleased to introduce Dr. John Allegrante. Mm -hmm. Well, Mark, um, <clears throat> thank you very much. I think that is the most uh, gracious introduction encomium that I've ever, um, you know, received. And it's so much warmer uh, than simply recounting a, a, a cold bio sketch of one's achievements or accomplishments. I really appreciate your uh, digging back into the history archive. And I remember that visit with great fond uh, memory. And in fact, um, everyone on the call or transmission today won't know this, but I had gotten out my program from that week. I don't know if you can see that, but this is the program that I've saved all of these years. Uh, Mark was my host and you were, you were an equally generous host during that visit as was um, uh, Bob Russell. So that, that was a real highlight of my career. And, and, and I, and, it, and if that's what it took to get an invitation to join you at New York Medical College or National Health Education Week, I'm, I'm glad I, I went. So thanks so much. Uh, and I also want to thank all of those at the, the Medical College, uh, you know, for making my visit uh, to this dog and pony show, as I like to call these things, uh, possible today. And I'm, I'm really pleased to see some people um, on the transmission that I know from Columbia, past students and, and others. So um, I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to do this. I, I thought about a number of talks that I could give, but the one talk that I think uh, would be most useful perhaps for uh, students and faculty who are um, you know, at a, a medical college and in fact, a more comprehensive medical university would be to talk a little about 
uh, the question of what role education plays in population health. And um, I do that in part because my principal appointment is at Teachers College or Graduate School of Education, Health and Psychology at Columbia University. And I also hold an appointment at the Mailman School of Public Health. So uh, what I've done here is to um, prepare a talk that I, I hope will capture your interest uh, give you some, um, you know, insight, uh, maybe spell with both an S and a C, uh, if I might. Um, and I've really designed it for a very broad audience. So um, it, it's, I'm kind of looking for the middle of an anticipated audience ranging from scholars, both young and old, to perhaps people from the community or people who are, who are tuning in from around the country. On, on the um, health education listserv that, that Mark has uh, organized and hosted for, I think, three decades now. So three questions, three related uh, lines of research. To what extent do health status and health behaviors of children and adolescents influence their school performance? To what extent does educational attainment influence population health? And to what extent do the early years in particular set the stage for school performance and what I would call the prospects for health across the lifespan? So we'll start with this first question. And, and very quickly, let me um, say that, that this is really grounded, this presentation is, is really being grounded in the social determinants of health. Uh, as I as I think you know, and as you can see, we, we now know that achieving population health goals will really require um, greater attention to a broader set of determinants that go well beyond individual health behavior. And I think most of you who have been through some basic courses will understand that these determinants include a number of things, improving access to high quality healthcare, uh, I would say creating the social circumstances through neighborhoods and through the built environment that really support healthful living, uh, which incidentally, I would say very quickly, includes elements of infrastructure. Uh, these are things that can protect the public from harm, like safe drinking water, uh, functioning power grids, uh, and wide availability of broadband capacity. These are all things that are part of infrastructure, not to mention a you know, competent and robust public health workforce and public health infrastructure. Um, in addition, a peaceful uh, social and, and community context that's free of racism, free of structural racism and, and violence, uh, and of course, economic stability. And finally, access to high quality schools and the promise of education, which is really the focus uh, of my talk today. Now, there, there's a contextual issue here that dates back over uh, two decades or so. And I wanna say a little bit about it because uh, it's, it's related to why I think uh, there's been so much interest over the last two decades in uh, looking at how we can in, improve the health of students um, because that is related to their academic performance. And that contextual issue at least for my talk today, is, is really the changing epidemiology of disease and chronic disease in particular, most notably the trends in obesity among both adults and children who obviously will grow into adulthood. And you can see data here. I don't have to go over this. You know that we've been seeing you know, an increase over um, you know, a couple of few decades now in the prevalence rates of obesity in people who are overweight. Um, this became a, um, a, a major issue back in the early 2000s for people in schools of public health and for people in schools of education. I was interested in this because, um, you know, I realized as part of a, a National Health Education Week celebration that was on the counter almost 20 years ago, uh, we, were, we were trying to make the case for better health education in schools, but it was difficult to do in some ways because we were dealing with the rollout of something called No Child Left Behind under the second Bush administration. And, you know, setting aside the constitutional issues, 
and and the data you know measurement issues um you know there there were these curriculum issues that essentially distorted the curriculum through no child left behind by you know focusing on high stakes testing um you know basic core subjects while things like physical education and health education in the arts and theater being pushed off to the periphery to focus on that that high stakes testing and so when i looked at this it, it was pretty evident that we were we were pulling away from health education in schools and physical activity just at the moment that we were experiencing a burgeoning epidemic of uh, children and adolescents um, who, are, who are gaining more and more weight uh, and becoming overweight. And, and so what we also saw uh, develop was a series of uh, studies, both at state level and certainly by university scholars that began to uh, take note of the possible connection between those things that happened in school, such as physical education and health education and, and what academic achievement looked like. And in fact, California in 2004 produced a, uh, a major study looking at the relationship between physical fitness and academic achievement in that state. And here you see the California standards test in English language arts and physical fitness test scores for fifth, seventh, and ninth uh, grades. And you, I think you can see um, that the higher the fitness score, the higher the achievement on the English language arts assessment. Similarly, uh, in the California standards test in mathematics, we, we saw that academic performance in math tracked on overall fitness as measured by the physical fitness test scores. And again, students who were physically fit did better. So that was sort of some tantalizing ob observational data that were beginning to come out in the early uh, 2000s. Now, beyond the observational data, um, more and more investigators um, began to look at uh, really developing experimental evidence of the effect of physical fitness. Um, and, and that work has been accumulating in this particular study by uh, Charles Hillman at the University of Illinois at that time, the effect of an acute session of moderate treadmill walking on behavioral and, and neuroelectric indices of the cognitive control uh, of attention and applied aspects of cognition involved um, uh, in school-based academic performance as measured by the, the wide range achievement test uh, was being looked at. And the slide shows the results of the study for three elements of cognitive control in academic performance, reading, reading comprehension, spelling, and arithmetic. Uh, and in students undergoing the exercise versus those at rest, the students getting the exercise did much better, in fact, significantly better for reading comprehension uh, and you can see that spelling and arithmetic uh, performance certainly was directionally consistent with the hypothesis, which, which was essentially if you got more oxygenated blood to the brain through physical activity, um, you know, you, you might be able to see better performance on uh, complex cognitive tasks that are, uh, you know, necessary in schools. And you know, this was another slide from the report. This is an uh, electroencephalographic brain scan here. Uh, this also indicated an improvement in response uh, accuracy, larger you know, P3 amplitude uh, uh, waves, and better performance on the academic achievement tests across tasks following this aerobic uh, exercise relative to being at rest. Um, and you can see at the bottom here, there's you know, a fair amount of brain activity lighting up in both elements of the, of, of the test that were uh, conducted. So I, I think what this means is that you know, your, your you know, brain on exercise does well, it's a good thing. And uh, I've always loved this cartoon from the New York Times, just, it just fits perfectly for the kind of work that Charlie Hillman and his group was doing. Now, um, let me just quickly say, apart from something like activity, physical activity, and I'll be coming back to it uh, later, uh, there's a much, much larger picture here uh, with regard to the relationship of health to academic achievement. And it, 
it's frankly complicated uh, by a, a much broader range of individual, social, and community factors. In our own work, my Icelandic colleagues and I, um, we've been looking at how cumulative risk over the early life course affects academic achievement in, population, in a population-wide study of approximately 1,000 children that we've studied. Uh, they're adolescents and they're from the 2000 birth cohort in Reykjavik, which is the largest city in Iceland. For those of you who get this confused with Greenland, it's the island to the, the north and east of Greenland. So it's in the upper reaches of the uh, North Atlantic. And, um, you know, we have found some really compelling um, data that, that looks at the cumulative risk. Uh, this shows you each of several additional risk factors, maternal smoking, parental disability, and you know, maltreatment among others. These are all associated with steady decline in academic achievement for both fourth and seventh graders that we've studied. So academic achievement declines really in proportion to the number of risk, risk factors in early life. So if you think about this as a backpack that children are going off to school with, if you start putting things like a mother who smokes, uh, a, a young mother who smokes, you know, uh, low family income, which of course, you know, is, is a major covariate that, that trumps everything. But, you know, maltreatment, uh, domestic abuse in homes, you put all that stuff in the backpack, the backpack gets heavier, it burdens the child and uh, the implications for that in terms of the short term for performance academically, but also for the long term are quite profound. Um, so with this kind of background, uh, and again, we're talking about the relationship between health status and health behaviors of children and adolescents and their school performance. We have for uh, approximately 30 years uh, been promoting through CDC, the comprehensive uh, coordinated school health program. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is important because we know that more than 95% of young people uh, in the United States are in school for 13 or more critical years of their development. And as this seminal work that was produced in 1998 that laid out all this uh, points out, health is academic because helping young people make sense. Uh, helping young people to stay healthy is a fundamental part of what makes sense as a mission for schools. Health behaviors are associated with academic achievement, we've known. They clearly influence the quality of life uh, for youth and, and their ability to contribute to live you know, productive lives. And ultimately school health programs can help um, you know, improve student academic achievement generally. So this is a really important model that, that we've worked with. And this is what it looks like. The original model was eight components and you can see health education at the very top, um, but these other areas of interest were uh, also critical. You know, since the, the promulgation of that, other researchers, I have a colleague that Mark knows at Teachers College, Charles Bash, who has also been looking at the literature, um, you know, since the original publication of the uh, Coordinated School Health Program, uh, he and others have sought to build upon the CDC model by reviewing the literature, uh, finding that several, in this case, educationally relevant health disparities will require attention if we are to close what is now a persistent achievement gap uh, that we see. And it's especially critical for children and adolescents who are living in urban areas and, and in impoverished social circumstances. So the failure to address these disparities as a matter of policy really does jeopardize the possibilities for academic achievement. Uh, as well as dampening the longer term prospects for health across the lifespan. So the most recent iteration uh, has been to build out on the original CDC model. This is the uh, now uh, 10 component um, uh, whole school, whole community, whole child, or so-called WISC model. It's CDC's newest framework. Uh, and um, it's, it's uh, important because it, it's a model that is very much student-centered. Uh, it emphasizes the role of the entire community in supporting schools and the connections between health and academic achievement and the importance of evidence-based school policies. So 
let's leave that first question. Let's go to this question. To what extent does educational attainment influence population health? And uh, so we're, 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 we're kind of flipping this now. We're, we're not looking so much at what the learner who goes to school, uh, what their health status might be or what their health behaviors might be and how that affects their ability to take advantage of what the school offers. This is more about once we have young people in school and they in fact can take advantage of schooling, um, what happens when they stay there or more importantly, what happens if they don't stay there? And um, this is really, I think, uh, very important research. It's got, I think, the most policy relevant implications. And part of that policy relevancy has to do with what our colleague, Paul, Paula Braveman, uh, published in the Annual Review of Public Health back uh, a decade ago. Uh, she looked at the multiple pathways linking education to health. And I, I really like this conceptualization, this schematic in which she looks at, you know, three distinct pathways. If you look at the top, we start with educational attainment. And, and typically this is what health education and the curriculum and instruction seek to do. We, we seek to prepare young people with the health knowledge, uh, literacy in particular, and behaviors, and that these things can affect, you know, dietary selections, decisions about, you know, engaging in exercise, um, you know, avoiding drugs and alcohol, and, and being better at health and, and disease management. That's, that is a pathway to health through direct instruction. The other two pathways, educational attainment that prepares people for work is absolutely critical for people to participate in the economy. And you can see that, that you know, by getting an education, you improve your working conditions, you, you improve your work-related resources, including support from people, and you get something known as income. You get an alfalfa pellet for going to work and engaging in something that gives you you know, self-esteem and, and meaningful uh, purpose in life. Uh, so that we think is also ultimately, um, you know, important in producing health outcomes. The third one I like because it, to me, it's all about comportment. This is about how education and going to high school and particularly going to college is really about helping people to navigate with agency, uh, developing, you know, the personal sense of agency the self-efficacy for the various things that we want to try to do in life. But more importantly, um, you know, control, uh, achieving social standing, getting social support, a delay of gratification, understanding that life choices now can have a, make a big, big difference later on. Um, and, and so you can see how this would be related ultimately uh, to health. And in fact, Paula's uh, conceptualization, uh, I, I think over the years, uh, has, has borne out um, her, her view in the sense that there is some research that has uh, demonstrated uh, the links between education and actual health outcomes. We know, for example, from some work uh, that, that at age 25, for example, US adults without a high school diploma can expect to die, not die nine years sooner than college graduates. And we know that among whites with less than 12 years of education, life expectancy at age 25 falls by more than three years for men and by more than five years for women between 1990 and 2008. And by 2011, the prevalence of diabetes had reached 15% for adults without a high school education compared to 7% for college graduates. And, and here from this paper in JAMA, you can see prevalence and in, in incidence, and you can follow the lines. You know, the, the, the line at the top is, is that individual who has less than a high school education. The line in the middle in both figures is, is a high school completion. And, and the line below is having greater than a high school education. So again, more evidence that this all tracks. Now, I, I also want to say a little about where education can really pay off. And I'm gonna kind of begin to move to the third section uh, and talk a little bit about my own work with my Icelandic colleagues again. But first I wanna talk about uh, Peter Munig's work. He's a colleague of mine at Mailman School of Public Health. 
Uh, he's developed this conceptual framework that you see here, which illustrates some of what he has you know, theorized are the pathways through which a high quality early education intervention can improve both intermediate health outcomes, such as behavioral risk factors and, and psychological stress. And, and if you look closely, you can see shaded boxes, they indicate where the evidence supporting the linkage between early education and the health risk factor indicated in the boxes causal, uh, and in the light boxes, we see uh, linkages that are supported largely by correlational uh, studies alone. The single line arrows indicate positive correlations, uh, and the double line arrows indicate causal linkages. So I think this is a very good working uh, conceptual model of how we can view the pathway from on the left a really good high quality early childhood pre-kindergarten type program. Think about Head Start, for example, but also think about, you know, the Ypsilanti Michigan high school program of, of the last 30 to 40 years in early childhood. Again, this suggests that by making investments uh, in education, we get pretty good outcomes. And, and here's just, you know, one study that uh, has been reported, um, it's recent research on 40-year-old adults who attended pre-kindergarten programs in childhood. Um, they were provided, um, you know, really good uh, pre-kindergarten program. This provides some evidence that they are, in fact, more likely to be healthy as adults than those uh, who did not participate in that. And the findings, I think, show here that, you know, based on data from the evaluation of some 123 low income African-American children at a high risk of school failure, 58 of whom were randomly assigned to intervention group and 65 of whom who were randomized to control. We see that the program group received a high quality preschool program for ages three to four years old. There was a no program control group. And you can see for yourself uh, the differences in terms of arrest records, uh, earned income, graduation, et cetera. So again, I, I think these are all sort of, again, tantalizing, compelling kinds of bits of research that, you know, we're, we're pulling together uh, that I think, you know, when, when taken, you know, cumulatively and, and across time, they, they're making a convincing case for doing some things differently than we are doing. So finally, let me just go into my last part of my presentation, and I, I want to talk about the extent to which uh, the early years really do set the stage for school performance and the prospects for uh, better health um, and a better life and better quality of life across the lifespan. So again, we started out with looking at individual health status and behavior of children going to school and how we can improve their academic performance by focusing on their health behavior and health status. We've just looked now at the importance of keeping young people in school and persuasive evidence, I think, emerging about how staying in school and educational attainment affects broader population health outcomes over time. I want to turn our attention now in the last part of my talk to um, what we're doing in Iceland, this wonderful Nordic country that I've been visiting for the last almost 20 years. I went there originally as a Fulbright scholar a Fulbright um, a global um, specialist initially, and then a Fulbright scholar, lived there for six months. And I've been continuing an ongoing program of research with Icelandic behavioral and social scientists. And part of the uh, inspiration for the work that we are now doing with the 2004 birth cohort in a longitudinal study that uh, we launched five years ago is, is really this work that Andrea Deneze at King's College London, who spoke at one of my first colloquia some years back at Teachers College that I had organized around biology, education, and health. And here you see Andrea Deneze's work on biological embedding of stress. And according to him, children exposed to adverse psychosocial experiences show elevated stress, um, uh, elevated disease risk in adulthood. Thus, you know, I think it, what we're saying here is that it's important to characterize the biological mechanisms through which children may be acquiring such lasting vulnerability 
uh, lasting exposure to disease, namely the mechanism of biological embedding. And he, Denise is a wonderful scholar. He's gone on to note that recent studies suggest that inflammation, as we might measure with C, CRP or C-reactive protein, could be an important developmental mediator translating childhood adverse psychosocial experiences into that biologic risk that we see later in life turn up as Alzheimer's or cardiovascular disease or some cancers or other chronic diseases where cellular level inflammation, oxidation, uh, you know, being the root of all evil, if you will, in terms of putting us on pathways uh, to, um, you know, disease. So a key unanswered question in all this is when the effect of childhood, um, you, you know, stress on inflammation emerges. When, when does that actually emerge? This is a schematic curve. It's not drawn to scale. We don't know what the data would fit. We don't know what data would fit to these lines. It's, it's a conceptual model. But the significance of the question, I think, lies in its potential to really uncover the origins of enduring disease vulnerability in children exposed to adverse psychosocial experiences in particular, and to suggest the best timing for interventions. Um, and I, I would say that th this, I won't spend a lot of time on this. You, you can look at it on your uh, screens as well as I can. Um, there, there clearly are still major gaps in our knowledge of how individual societal and biologic factors across the lifespan from very early on to adolescence really interact uh, to shape the risk for emotional problems, various harmful behaviors that we see in adolescence. So my Icelandic colleagues and I have been conducting a life course study of the 2004 birth cohort in all of Iceland, several thousand uh, children, uh, that's designed really to identify and understand the potentially modifiable risk and protective factors that can indeed inform early detection and intervention uh, that we think could prevent adolescent emotional problems and harmful behaviors, um, and, and to be sure, you know, school failure. So, you know, we're starting very early in life. We've got, we've got many sources of data, including, you know, upon birth, we have, you know, um, uh, heel prick blood spot data of the infant. We've got annual surveys. We've got environmental data. We've got administrative data, and we've got epigenetic data that uh, you can only get in Iceland, frankly, uh, with which we can follow and paint a very complete picture of this cohort going over the years um, you know, from, from this point forward. And, and I think that's important um, because if, if you think about this work by James Heckman, who of course is the well-known uh, economics uh, economist at, at University of Chicago is a Nobel Prize uh, award-winning uh, economists. He's looked at the rates of human to uh, the return to human capital investment in disadvantaged children. And if you look at this, the declining figure that you see here plots the payout per year um, per dollar invested in human capital programs at different stages, uh, preschool, school, and then post-school. And the opportunity cost of funds is really to pay out per year if the dollar is invested in financial assets, you know, uh, you know maybe like a passbook savings account. Um, an optimal investment program from the point of view of economic efficiency, you know, equates returns across all stages of the life cycle to the opportunity cost. And the figure here shows that at current levels of funding, we're, we're probably over-investing in most schooling and post-schooling programs and really under investing in preschool programs, especially for those who are, are disadvantaged. So it, you know, when you think about, you know, you know, early start, uh, uh, you, you know, the, the, the head start for an early start and, and the argument by largely, I think women who have argued, uh, you know, quite persuasively that we need more early childhood uh, I think there's a, a good case to be made, especially knowing how fragile those first couple few years of life are. So uh, to close out, what are the implications? Uh, well, I, I think there are uh, several, we, you know, basically we, the question is whether we can connect the dots uh, and can we use what we already know and what we are now learning 
from our research to both strengthen academic achievement and sets the stage for improved health outcomes over the life course. You know, can, can we, do we have the political will, I think, to better operationalize in policy, in our communities, on the ground, you know, all of these findings from the science that we have available. Um, despite that, I think, we can, I think we can, but that, but despite that, I think there are also many unanswered questions. And, you know, I'm sorry, I can't answer all of them today in a 40 minute talk, but, you know, questions like, are there specific aspects of the educational experience that do relate more than others to health? You know, are there specific pathways and, and more specific mechanisms through which education exerts its influence on specific health outcomes? And, and, and I think very importantly, given the state of schools as an infrastructure item in this country in terms of environment, physical and otherwise, are there school characteristics or other factors that affect both educational attainment and health outcomes? These are really, I think, pregnant questions for us as a society. And, you know, I think it, they, they are pregnant in a sense because, you know, we, we face these, you know, wicked, you know, problems, these policy trade-offs. Where should we focus to improve population health? You know, um, what should be the optimal, ba optimal balance between, say, investments in medical care, which, you know, we, we, we've gone over the last six to seven decades with investments in biomedical, you know, research and, and capacity. You know, how do we balance all that largesse with the very small, minuscule largesse that we put into public schools, for example? What is the optimal balance in fostering, you know, our efforts to teach compensatory skills at the individual level and enacting policy and say environmental change at another level uh, to, to bring about improvements in health? And then finally, you know, are there optimal developmental periods for intervention as Heckman has suggested? You know, maybe we put much, much more money into those early childhood programs that I, I think, by the way, Biden would, would actually support because of Jill Biden's uh, counsel. So to come back to where we started, the social determinants of health, Healthy People 2030 has carried over uh, one of the uh, goals, which is to increase educational opportunity, help children and adolescents do well in school, and to keep them in school so that they graduate. This comes right out of what we know about that second question, the extent to which educational attainment uh, really keeps people um, you know, in school so that they can improve health over time. So to conclude, uh, I would say that, um, and, and again, you know, this has been a quick step here. You know, it's not been a thorough review of what we know are some of the methodologic issues in, in the research uh, and the challenges that we face. But I, I think, you know, after almost 50 years for me in, in all of this, um, I think it's pretty clear that we need to address a, a multiple set of determinants of health, especially behavioral patterns, but uh, I would also argue social circumstances and certainly education. I think there needs to be much more of a focus on young people, young children, early childhood development and their behaviors. And I would argue, especially given everything we know about physical activity and all cause mortality over time, I would, I would focus on physical activity uh, because I think we've got a lot of data there um, and then finally, I think we, we, we certainly need to keep pushing on educational attainment, uh, looking at the number of years of secondary education that's completed over time. So I think, uh, Professor, I will stop there uh, and take whatever questions there might be. I'll stop sharing my screen so that's I can look at everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, John. This was really good. Uh, uh, really oh, hit home with me know. because my background's health behavior, so uh, I uh, uh, in health education. So, a quick question I wanted to ask you, and it was when you were showing those slides about the treadmill exercise before the uh, cartoon one. I'm willing to bet that most of those treadmill activities aren't extremely intense. It's just you know probably a walking, which is I think. Uh, important to acknowledge you don't have to you know uh when you're talking about fitness you don't have to talk about these elite soccer players or baseball players or football simple walking and uh, other things can do a great amount of uh, of uh, uh, improvement in one's uh, uh intellect 
May I respond, Professor? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm so glad that you've made that point uh, disguised as a question. And, um, you know, I'm convinced because, you know, about 25 years ago, I did uh, what is probably my most cited um, report in the literature, a doctoral student, I reported out a study in Annals of Internal Medicine, which gets a fair amount of citation. And, and it was a supervised fitness walking program for people with osteoarthritis of the knees. We did the classic you know, safety and efficacy trial. Uh, and we told, we, we, we were convinced that doctors who were telling people with, with joint disease to rest was the wrong advice. And we did a clinical trial that basically showed them that we were right and they were wrong. And it actually changed clinical practice. But what it did for me, it actually changed my behavior because, you know, I think I was probably still in my early thirties or so. And you know, I, I, I played organized sports in college and, uh, you know, I never got to right field in Yankee Stadium as a ball player. So I had to find something to be active with. And I just began walking. I didn't have joint disease and I don't. And I've been walking long distance walking uh, for the last 25 years. I walk four or five, six miles on the weekend every day. During the week, I get at least two or three, sometimes four. And I, I, I think that is what has really benefited me in so many ways. And I think that's what they're getting at here. I think this work about, I mean, the treadmill is a controlled environment for a test of efficacy, but for the test of effectiveness, you've got to go out and walk in your neighborhood or hike or, or find places where you can safely you know, walk. And, I, and, and in the sub, subsequent years, we've seen all of these papers and they're often published in JAMA that have looked at you know, walking, walking intensity, and, and all cause mortality in very large longitudinal studies. And all of them have shown the benefits of walking. So if people leave this talk today with no other advice, nothing else that they consider, you know, think about walking if you're not doing it on a regular basis. It's my, it's my advice after every Zoom call with my students, I, I just say, listen, don't be complacent. We're living through a pandemic, but get outside if you can, if you're in a safe neighborhood, wear the mask if you have to, but walk. Just get out and get some walking in. That's great. Or if you have a treadmill, you don't have to run yourself to exhaustion. You know, you just, you know, you can use that as, uh, technique as well. So uh, that's this... right. I think the most recent report, JAMA, maybe a year ago, maybe eight months ago came out. It, it basically said that intensity was good, but it, you, you, it wasn't ne necessarily, uh, it wasn't necessary to get the benefit of simply walking. So I, I'm not suggesting you go out there and stroll, but you don't have to para walk either. You have yeah. to get steps in. It's the steps that count, I think. Yeah, that's great. Uh, we'll like to, you, you can either send a question on the chat. And by the way, I encourage you, if you haven't opened the chat yet, all the links are there, you can save them and uh, uh, go to the various uh, links if need be. Uh, or if you just have a question, you wanna raise your hand, uh, we can call on you. Uh, Erica, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello, um, thank you so much for the great presentation. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, um, besides physical education and of course the actual classroom education that typically accompanies that curriculum, um, recess um, and the activity that happens during recess, free play um, and, and recess as it is, it kind of stops after elementary school how do you feel about the importance of that kind of activity, um, that unstructured kind of activity during the school day, as far as learning? Uh, really great question, Erica. Thank you so much. Um, you know, having been married uh, for X number of years, I'll put it that way, uh, to a woman who was a uh, early childhood educator, she believed that unstructured play, uh, whether it was during recess or throughout the day, particularly with young children, is very important to creativity um, and development of critical thinking, uh, emotional intelligence, all of the things that I think we, we are beginning to now understand are absolutely critical to the complete and comprehensive education of a human being in whose uh, care we have been placed as educators. And so, you know, I, I think uh, 
young children, but also middle schoolers and high school students, often because of schedules now that have had to be adjusted over time with overcrowding in schools. Um, you know, I, I think all of them in some ways, there's been encroachment on the kind of time that they need beyond the curriculum and instruction. Um, and I would also say, having just completed uh, another report, which I'm, I'm really excited about, uh, so I'll, I'll say it, uh, my Icelandic colleagues and I are about to publish a paper in the Lancet Psychiatry that's looked at our cohort and the impact of COVID-19 on being isolated. And there is uh, unequivocal, unequivocal evidence that the isolation associated with COVID-19 restrictions and, and limitations on mobility and going out of the house lockdowns has been e extremely damaging to young adolescents uh, and young adolescent women in particular. Um, because I think it's that unstructured interaction that, that they enjoy when they go to school, they are with their peer group and these mediated um, electronic forms just, you know, don't cut it as much. So I, I think we're seeing, you know, and perhaps even long lasting impacts of the pandemic um, on, on young people. So the sooner we can get back to school, and I think this is the importance of the vaccination for teachers and others, um, I, I think maybe we'll be able to claw back the, the, the losses that I, I think have been substantial for young people. But I, I've gone beyond your, your question, Erica, but I, I hope that is a response to you. Well, and I would even say adults need to have more playtime. You know, yeah. we have, we, we don't allow ourselves to play. All of our uh, relaxation head or activities have very structured component. But if you have, you know, grandchildren or young children, it's, it's energizing just to play without any rules per se. So, <laughs> you know, we did a we did a study a few years back on trying to induce positive affect. We were experimenting with how we could improve adherence in cardiopulmonary disease patients, uh, people with asthma, people with coronary artery disease, people with hypertension, all of whom went through a clinical trial with the same methods that we used and the intervention that we were testing was positive affect. And the one in the pilot testing that we did to learn what it was that made people feel elevated and feel positive, that, that brief elevation that one gets, it was a smiling baby's face. And so I, I think you, you're onto something there, Professor. <laughs> uh, uh, other questions? Any other questions? Just raise your hand and, uh, or just uh, unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and ask. So. While, while people are waiting, I'm, I'm trying to also see if there's any in the chat room. Uh, the other thing too, uh, John, I want to talk about, you mentioned uh, uh, school, you know, comprehensive coordinated school health initiatives, which we've seen a great increase over the last 30 years. The one drawback, and I'd like to see if you could uh, kind of talk about this is as, as important that, as that is, there is also the failure to hire health teachers to teach health. The people who are teaching health don't necessarily have that background. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting point. And um, it reminds me of how, <clears throat> because New York Medical College is in Valhalla in the state of New York, the great state of New York, once upon a time, the great state of New York uh, was the leading state in the union. This goes back to the 1950s now, 1960s. But it was the leader in legislation in Albany to put robust uh, and, and everything that we knew at the time about how to approach health education in schools. It was the leading state in terms of legislating for health and, and health was mandated back in the, I think, 1960s to be taught throughout schools and later further, I think, amendments to that, um, you know, um, required that the teacher of this particular curriculum subject area must be a health education specialist. We did not have the certified health education specialist credential in those days, but you know, the State University of New York at Brockport, the State University of New York at Cortland, and, and a couple of other places 
they were the engines of um, the teaching workforce in health and physical education. Um, but you know that the the impact of that and and you know state budgets being what they have been, I th I think there's been a waxing and waning of of uh, attention to that that important detail. Putting in the classroom someone who understands the comprehensive coordinated school health program, understands how to partner with school nurses and other stakeholders in the school and the community to ensure that those various eight or now ten elements or components are address. I, I think that that is still a, a challenge for us yeah. in many states. And you're right. New York was the number one. Do you know what the number two state was? Might have been California. No, it was Minnesota. Illinois? Minnesota. Okay. Oh, I, yes, that's right. I, yeah. I, I, that's where I went. And we were uh, following New York in that we were separating a major of health and physical education into a, just a health education major. And my roommate was an HPE major, but I was a health ed major. And uh, we, we were making those uh, transitions, but we were following New York's uh, lead. So uh, Denise yeah. Tahara has a question. Hi, first, I, I wanna thank you for your uh, very uh, insightful uh, presentation. Now, is that, is, that Denise, is that insightful with an S or a C? How are you yes, <laughs> I love it. I love puns, uh, absolutely. Or double entendres as this one is. Um, I, I wanna go back to a slide that you had up earlier. Um, you don't need to pull it up, but um, it, it, it just, um, I want to sort of fast forward on it. So it was pretty striking the impact of um, physical activity on, um, on education. And I wanted to sort of fast forward to college age students who become the ultimate decision makers for their households as well as for themselves. And particularly during COVID, the weight issues in particular, you know, the isolation and everything else, but a lot of the weight um, or disordered eating that we've seen has been uh, amplified during COVID-19. People are referring to excessive weight gains as well as excessive, um, you know, disordered eating. And I wanted to get your thoughts about, um, you know, you were talking about at the, you know, the different colleges that who were, who were generating and developing curriculum in the workforce basically to be working in this area. But what you've, have you seen with colleges and where are there opportunities to do something? I can tell you when I graduated, when I went to Cornell, there, was, there were two requirements. We had um, a large physical activity, a physical phys ed requirement, believe it or not. We also mm -hmm. had to, um, we had to actually, um, there was a swimming requirement. Yes. You had to pass a swim test. Um, so- Columbia so, and, still has that. <laughs> Yeah, I think Cornell still does too. And I don't, we're probably the only two schools, certainly in New York State, maybe even in the country that have those requirements. And, you know, I remember at first when I became a freshman, it was like, what? But, you know, now looking back on it and looking at all the food challenges, um, as well as the lack of understanding of those, uh, you know, sort of the health literacy, the food and activity, I was wondering whether there's any work being done in this area or what your thoughts really were on this. Well, Denise, thanks for the question and, and, and thanks for your kind words. That's a big question for me. Um, I, I think there is work being done on it. I'm, I would not be surprised if my colleagues at Teachers College and you know what is the oldest nutrition education program in the country, I know the Tisch Center is concerned with, about these kinds of things. Um, I, I, I think colleges and universities because of the ubiquitous nature uh, across the American landscape, the fact that they are the, 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 they are the engines in so many respects of you know, preparing a democratic society and culture. Um, you know, in many ways, like high schools were at one time, you know, places where not only people went to learn you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic, but high schools were charged with dealing with everything from sexuality education to driver education to everything else. And, and you know, if you take the view of our schools as being broad social service agencies, which I think they are, mm -hmm. I think they need to be, particularly in, in, in the case of secondary education, but our universities have become very similar in some ways. Um, <laughs> dare I say they're all country clubs or most of them, many of them are quite quite a bit like country clubs in themselves, um, but they've got the resources, they've got right. the knowledge, they've got people who know things about these areas, they've got the resources to facilitate 
lifelong learning. And, and my major concern about college and university, it goes back to the sports issue and, and activity is that many people, young people go to college hoping for professional athletic careers, uh, prof you know, professional sports team type careers. Uh, and if that doesn't, um, you know, materialize for them, they, 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 they leave and, and they no longer are playing, you know, right. organized team sport. So I, I really think colleges need to do more uh, to reinforce the importance of activity that people can learn to do as lifelong learning. And I, I think this is one of the reasons why you will find physical activity requirements still in the curriculum at major colleges and universities and some of them elite uh, institutions yeah. and where they still have a, a swimming requirement as well. Columbia requires, well, oh man, I would never be able to graduate. <laughs> that is, it's amazing. So I, I, I have a feeling there have been many an undergraduate who on the night just before graduation had to fulfill that requirement and were just thrown into the pool and did the best they could. I, I, I can't <laughs> swim, but I can wade really well, but uh, right. I can't No, swim. it's, uh, you know, they took the uh, machine, the crew machines out of the pool so you could do it. So. Oh, wow. So, uh, we got about a minute left. Any other final questions or comments? Uh, and as you're uh, thinking about that, I do want to uh, acknowledge our, uh, our sister departments in the school of uh, physical education and speech language in the chat room. Uh, Michael Shikarjian shared a link uh, to celebrate National Public Health Week. They are doing a couple of things as well. So check out that. what they're doing. Uh, we're trying to make this an all inclusive type of thing. But any other final questions? John, this has been fantastic. It's been great seeing you. And I really appreciate you taking your time to do this. There's one more and question in the chat. Oh, yeah, oh, I'm please. sorry, it just came up. Yeah, just okay. came up, just came up. Yeah, uh, can you speak about the potential role of yoga and meditation in schools or earlier? You know, personally, I cannot. That's a, that's a good question, I think, uh, in light of, um, you know, emerging work that's being done about mindfulness generally. And I see these modalities, if you will, of things like yoga, and, and, and other elements of these mindfulness strategies as being really important. In fact, when I mentioned the positive affect study a moment ago, this is, my, my, I didn't continue along this line. We, we finished these trials, we reported out. Um, I think we've just scratched the surface on this kind of work, but it, for some of the colleagues around this project, they actually went off into the direction of a mindfulness study because we we're you know, getting impressed with data that uh, has been generated around things like yoga and other mindfulness. So I, I just don't do work in that area. I can't speak knowledgeably, knowledgeably about it, but I think there, again, is something there that is going to be of value for people. And, um, and I think there, there are uh, interesting data that have been published about the impact of this on things like respiration, blood pressure, uh, and maybe longer term outcomes as well. Reducing anxiety, you know, other types of, you know, and what's, inter what, what's uh, interesting is that there's pretty good evidence and yet you have some states, mostly maybe in the Southern that have banned the discussion of yoga because they think it's uh, a religion or, or, you know, so you have to get around using certain terminology, uh, but uh, the concepts are still very, uh, very valuable, so. Your, your mention of anxiety uh, is interesting. I, I am working with a um, humanities scholar, two humani three humanities scholars in editing a book on, on um, anxiety culture. And I'm fairly convinced that, um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if you remember the book, Medical Nemesis, um, Mark, and I'm, I'm blocking on the name of the author, but it was back in the 1970s. And he's a very famous, um, critic of, of um, organized medicine and, um, oh gosh, I'm just blocking on his name. But, you know, he took the concept of iatrogenesis, which is physician-induced illness or disease at the individual level, and he raised it to social and cultural iatrogenesis. And what we're doing with this book that we're working on is we're taking the concept of um, the, the medical idiom, if you will, of anxiety as a clinical entity and trying to understand it as now a social and cultural 
phenomenon. And I think in many respects, uh, we've seen this in the data in our young uh, Icelandic adolescent uh, boys and girls. Uh, anxiety is a major feature of what uh, the lived experiences for so many people now. Uh, you know, we began with the threats of, of foreign terrorism. Now we're dealing with domestic terrorism possibilities. Obviously, COVID has contributed greatly to this. But my sense is that uh, Ivan Illich, sorry, Ivan Illich was the great, um, you know, sort of uh, Marxist writer of the 60s and 70s. He wrote books like uh, Medical Nemesis. And, and, and I think that there's something to this idea of taking these, what, what are known as clinical, you know, medical idioms and raising them uh, as a concept that is really, I think, you know, much more characteristic of our, our collective lived experience. And I think anxiety is, is very much that. Oh. Again, this has been great. Uh, thank you for sticking around for a little bit longer than we were planning. Uh, uh, folks, uh, we will uh, be posting this on the webpage within a day or so. Uh, Michael, you can stop the recording.